All right. Well, welcome to Grand Rounds uh, on this lovely fall slash winter morning. Um, we are delighted uh, to have a great representation from endocrinology here um, and uh, to introduce our uh, esteemed speaker. Uh, we have Dr. Vince Krines, who is our division chief of endocrine to introduce Dr. Dudley Lemming. Vince. Thanks, Lynn. I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Dr. Lamming. Dr. Lamming is, is an associate professor in the Division of Endocrinology. Um, he did his PhD at Harvard studying with David Sinclair. Uh, and we are really, really fortunate to recruit him eight years ago, I believe, from the Whitehead Institute. And he has exceeded our expectations to say the least. So his lab focuses on the intersection between diet metabolism and aging. So what does that mean? He looks at what we eat and when we eat it and how that influences how nutrients are metabolized and ultimately how we age. So he's been incredibly productive, as I mentioned, I think 58 publications since joining our faculty, many in the most prestigious journals like Cell Metabolism, Nature Metabolism, nature aging. He's really well funded, two NIH R01 grants, a VA Merit Award and others. Um, he's won many awards, including uh, from our department, the Pustow Award. And it's fitting that we're in the Pustow room, I noticed coming in. Uh, he's also gotten a uh, Vilas Early Career Investigator Award from the UW. Many from societies, including a Nathan Schock Award from the Gerontological Society. And he's president elect of the American, let me see if I can get this right. The American Association, Aging Association, I believe. Did I get that right? Okay. So he's also a dedicated mentor, great lab to train in. Any of you residents or fellows looking for a research project, talk to Dudley. And I'd say his crowning achievement is that he has 4,000 followers on Twitter, maybe some of them watching. So Dudley, I'm really excited to see what I should and should not be eating so that I can stave off aging. And thank you for the lovely introduction. So if we're a mouse, um, we don't really have too much choices about what we might be eating. But humans can choose for a wide variety of different food options, what noted author Michael Pollan referred to as the omnivore's dilemma. And when we are making these decisions, we're always really interested in what we should be eating and how we can eat something that will make us healthy or, as we put it, um, age in a healthy manner. Now, for about a century, it's been known that a very effective way to extend both lifespan and health span is calorie restriction. Here on the left is work done by Rick Weindrick um, before he joined the University of Wisconsin, where he enjoyed a very distinguished career, um, showing that ad libitum fed animals have a much shorter lifespan than animals on a variety of different restricted regimens. And in mice, the restriction about 40% tends to lead to a maximum lifespan extension. Um, work done by Weindrick and Roz Anderson and Ricky Coleman has shown that very similar things occur in non-human primates, where you get extension of lifespan um, when you restrict calories by about 20 to 25%. Now, importantly, this doesn't just mean that you live longer, it means that you live healthier as well, because we're not really interested in extending the portion of life where you're frail, dependent on others um, to do activities of daily living, what we wanna do is get to the end of our lifespan and be really healthy and happy. So how do, how do we do that? Well, calorie restriction is great, but of course it's very difficult to imagine restricting our calories by 40%, particularly when so many people have trouble um, with being overweight and obese in the first place. So today I'm gonna to tell you two stories. The first is gonna be focused on maybe how calorie restriction works and what that might tell us about easier ways potentially um, to get some of these same benefits. And the second will be about uh, dietary composition. Can we not restrict calories, but change what type of food we're eating in a way that can make us healthier and live longer? <laughs> 
So when should I eat? So in the popular press, there's been a lot of attention to time-restricted feeding of late. And this suggests that if we restrict our calories to a certain number of hours per day, um, we might get leaner. And this works in mice and has been shown to be protective against Western diet. It's unclear whether it works in humans. So if you restrict your eating window enough, you are calorie restricted, whereas longer eating windows in uh, humans don't seem to work in the same way. But this is something that a graduate student in my lab, Heidi Pack, um, wanted to start investigating in the context of calorie restriction. And so one thing about calorie restriction in rodents is that for the last century that people have been doing these experiments, um, investigators have been lazy, essentially. So, you know, when we think about eating, right, we think about three meals a day plus some snacks. The normal eating pattern of a mouse is to eat about every four hours, primarily at night, because the animals are nocturnal. Um, but in calorie restricted animals, we only feed them once a day because we have to go to the cage, put a certain amount of food in, and we walk away. Um, and it turns out that this um, imposes fasting on the animals because calorie restricted animals, unlike animals that have free access to food, are hungry and they binge their food in about two hours. And so that means that the remaining 21 to 22 hours a day um, is essentially fasting. Now, some work that Rafa de Cabo and Roz Anderson did um, looking at diets that were originally fed to non-human primates and feeding these to mice um, found something really interesting by accident. Um, and so uh, here in both, all of these are two different diets. And then here's the pooled diets over here. And you can see that the animals that eat the shortest in each case are, are the animals that have ad libitum access to food. And in both of these diets, traditional calorie restriction, where we restrict to calories and only feel, feed them one meal a day, um, extended lifespan. But in between these curves um, are animals that uh, were a meal feeding control. And so these animals were fasted for about 12 hours a day. And you could see that even though these animals clearly don't get the full benefits of CR, um, they are still living a bit longer even because uh, perhaps their eating window is restricted. And so we wanted to interrogate this a bit more closely and try and find out whether the benefits of CR arise from the reduction in energy intake or from this self-imposed fasting period caused by the rapid consumption of food um, in about two to three hours. So to do this, we placed mice on one of four different diets. And I'm gonna show you uh, data from C57 black 6J male mice. And so just one str inbred strain and one sex of mice. We've done this in other strains and sexes as well. The results are fairly consistent. Um, and we place these mice on one of four diets. So either an ad libitum diet or a traditional calorie restricted diet where we restricted the animals by about 30% a day. And then two different studies. Um, one of these diets is a diluted diet. And so this diet that I'm gonna show you a bunch of data from um, has a normal diet and it's mixed with extra cellulose that the animals can't digest. And so that no matter how much they eat and they do eat more volume, they're still calorie restricted. So these animals are not fasted at any point, but they're energy restricted. And then um, we did a, temp a temporal restriction um, where we fed the animals three times a day over the course of the night. And this eliminated some of the binging behavior. So the short story is that all of these have very similar effects on weight and body composition. And there's some, di uh, some small differences between the regimens, but they all result in an animal that weighs less and is leaner, so less fat, fat uh, percentage. But there are some interesting things going on in terms of other readouts. So one of the things we do a lot, and I'll show you today several of these, are glucose tolerance tests. So we fast an animal overnight and then administer glucose in the morning. And then we track what happens to their blood glucose over time. This is very similar to the tests that are done in humans, um, particularly for gestational diabetes, where a person fasts and then consumes um, a glucose drink and their blood glucose is tracked over the next couple of hours. So all three of the uh, restricted dietary regimens um, lo lower the area under the curve, improving the glucose tolerance. Um, relative to ad libitum fed animals. So energy alone seems to be important for glucose tolerance. But the same is not true for insulin sensitivity. And one thing that calorie restriction is well known to do is improve insulin sensitivity um, in basically every mammal it's been examined in. And it's been examined in mammals all the range from mice up to non-human primates and humans. And what we saw was that the calorie restricted animals, the ones that ate one meal a day, 
had significantly improved insulin sensitivity. So these animals were given IP insulin and their blood glucose plunges doesn't happen anywhere near to the same extent in ad libitum fed animals um, or animals on diets uh, where they're eating the diluted diets. So here we see that fasting is really essential for this improvement in insulin sensitivity. We also used a different dietary regimen. So Heidi was able to train the mice um, to eat all their food in three hours. And this is an entire day's worth of food. So they're not calorie restricted, uh, but they know that the food's gonna be taken away. So they eat all of their food in a very short period of time. And what we see is that this actually has really interesting effects on the animal's physiology. So you could see that even though animals on a TR.AL diet, they're eating an entire normal day's worth of calories, they're eating it faster and they weigh less, they gain less weight. And in particular, they gain less adipose mass. And one thing that's really interesting is that CR here also inhibits the um, growth of lean mass um, and the fasting um, uh, diet without restricting energy intake does not. Fasting also seems to have really big improvements in glucose tolerance. And you could see again that both CR and this fasting alone without energy restriction regimen um, improves glucose tolerance. And both of these regimens improve insulin sensitivity. So here we have fasting alone without reducing your energy intake seems to recapitulate many of these beneficial effects of a CR diet. Now we want to take sort of a more broad view and look at this in a more global perspective. And we did this via transcriptional profiling where we take the animals, we take out their tissues and we um, look at all the different RNAs that are being expressed from all the different genes. And we try and figure out how expression levels change on each diet. And what we saw was that calorie restriction alone and our TR.AL regimen, this regimen where they're fasting without energy restriction, have very similar gene expression patterns. So depending on whether we're looking at inguinal white adipose tissue or the liver, and depending on exactly what we're looking at, about 80 to 90% of the genes and pathways that are induced by calorie restriction are also induced simply by fasting and having only one meal a day. Now we also tried the reverse of this. So we took animals and um, tried our diluted diet in the context of an aging uh, experiment. So here we're taking mice. Mice typically live about three years or so on um, median lifespan. So it's sort of a long-term experiment. And we fed them either their normal diet, their calorie restricted diet, or the diluted diet that's restricted for energy intake. So here we're eliminating the fasting period. Now, I think one thing that we all know is that as people age, um, and animals age as well, they tend to get frail. And that's true for mice, um, just as it is for humans. And we can quantify this a number of different ways. And people have come up with frailty indices for both humans, mice, and rats. And what's really interesting is that um, our ad libitum fed animals continue to have increases in frailty with age, um, whereas our calorie restricted animals, those increases are blunted. And this has been shown by other investigators as well. But our diluted diet mice, the mice that are eating less energy, get just as frail as our ad libitum fed animals. And this turns out to correlate over in terms of other performances as well. We tested these in cognitive assays, and we also tested this in lifespan. And you could see that calorie restriction is extending lifespan in these animals, whereas our diluted diet fed mice actually have a shorter lifespan. So what does this tell us? So first of all, fasting and lower energy intake both contribute to metabolic and molecular effects of, of a CR diet. Um, but fasting in particular is really sufficient for the beneficial effects of a calorie restriction diet on health. Um, and in particular, this effect on insulin sensitivity. From a transcriptional standpoint, fasting and CR seem to be virtually identical in adipose tissue and liver. Of course, there are many other tissues um, to look at. And decreasing energy intake without fasting doesn't seem to give you the benefits of CR. So this actually has a lot of real world implications. There are a couple thousand people in the United States who are doing calorie restriction. Of course, many people who go on diets from time to time. And many of these individuals in the past would be eating three meals a day, um, even though you know, they're eating less food. The flip side of this, of course, is if we think that this applies to humans, of course, mice and humans are not identical. You should eat as many donuts as you want this morning and then not eat for the rest of the day. 
And um, as was pointed out, same thing goes true for Thanksgiving, right? You're gonna have one big meal. You've got about three hours if you're a mouse to eat that Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, then the rest of the day, uh, maybe not. So moving past calories, um, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about dietary composition. And dietary composition is made up of three major macronutrients. Um, these are uh, where you get your energy from. And those are protein, fat, and carbohydrate. And for many years, people have thought that dietary fat, in particular, very saturated fats are bad for you and that we should be eating less of them. Um, more recently, there's been a focus on dietary carbohydrates and suggesting that particular refined sugars might be bad for us, be driving epidemics of obesity and diabetes. In all of this, dietary protein has been thought to be relatively good. And so many of you are probably familiar with dietary advice saying we should eat more protein. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. One, it's satiating, um, so it helps us feel full. Dietary protein, of course, could also be useful for building skeletal muscle. So lots of people who are exercising are gonna be taking dietary protein. Um, and it also crowds out calories from fat and carbohydrates. So uh, displaces these so-called so bad sources of calories. But it turns out that probably this isn't true. So a number of retrospective and prospective clinical trials have been conducted over the last couple of decades. And all of them lead to the surprising conclusion that the more protein you eat, um, the worse off you are. So in a retrospective analysis of NHANES data, it was shown that low protein diets um, are associated with less cancer, less diabetes, and lower over overall mortality for those under the age of 65. A prospective cohort study in Europe looking at about 40,000 people over a decade found that people who are in the highest quartile of protein consumption actually had about twice the diabetes risk of those in the lowest quartile. And then there have been a variety of other studies uh, suggesting, um, perhaps less definitively, that high protein diets are associated um, with cardiovascular mortality. And so less protein would be better for the heart. Um, so one thing that um, we've done over the past uh, eight years is to look at how this dietary protein restriction regulates metabolic health in both humans and mice. And the conclusion from these studies conducted by our lab and other groups is that if you restrict dietary protein in either a person, um, and this can be a person who is overweight or a person who has type 2 diabetes, you restrict it for about six to eight weeks you get improvements in metabolic health. So in humans, that looks like lower fasting blood glucose, improved insulin sensitivity, and reduced adiposity. In mice, we see much the same thing. For the most part, lower fasting blood glucose, improved glucose tolerance, potentially improved insulin sensitivity as well. And there's a lot of benefits, particularly for diet-induced obese mice. Um, it helps them get lean very quickly. So why should we study diets in mice? So stu studying diets in mice has a lot of advantages compared to study, um, studies that we and others have done in humans. The first is that mice eat, eat exactly what we want them to, right? So there's no question that um, the mice is going out and having a snack. There's no other questions about, you know, are they writing things down in their food diaries correctly and so on. We can measure exactly how much they eat. So um, a number of years ago, there's a person um, in the Department of Medicine whose job was to call up people and say, was that a small pat of butter, a large pat of butter, a medium pat of butter, right? For all these different types of nutrition studies. Nowadays, um, the sort of cutting edge is to take pictures of your meal before and after with your smartphone, but still you're sort of estimating how much people are eating. And mice, we can just measure it. And we can control diet composition precisely. So in our protein restricted human study, we're taking people who were you know, eating hamburgers, steak, things that are really high in protein, um, and then moving them to things that are less high in protein. But that means that they're eating more fish and more greens and everything is changing at the same time. Whereas in mice, we could just control the diet composition and we know exactly what we're doing. And we could do a lot more tests um, as another advantage. So, one thing that is a disadvantage of mice is that mice strains in particular uh, tend to be inbred, so they're genetically identical. And so um, one of the things that we've been working on recently has been trying to understand how genetic background and genetic diversity plays into a response to dietary protein. 
So here we're looking at young mice who are fed um, different protein diets. The control diet here is 21% protein. The low protein diet is 7% protein. And the medium protein diet is right in the middle at 14%. A typical human diet is around 16 to 17% uh, protein, so somewhere between medium and control. And so what we see is that there's a lot of differences in our response here. So our male black C57, black 6 mice, sort of a standard in the metabolic field, um, gain less weight on a low protein diet, but that's not true when we look at C57, black 6 females. The reverse is true for DBA mice, and just another different inbred strain that people study and the effect on dietary um, and on diets and sex interaction is flipped. And then we also looked at HET3 mice. So these are a genetically heterogeneous strain made from four inbred strains. And so each one of these animals is unique, but we can reproduce the population essentially at will. And what we see is that here we have um, quite a lot of variation between um, the male mice, whereas the female mice seem not to respond. This is true for other phenotypes as well. So here we're looking at glucose tolerance tests done on the same set of, of mouse strains and sexes. And you can see that we get really good responses in C57 uh, mice. So these C57 males, remember, lost weight or rather gained less weight, and they also have improved in glucose tolerance. But the females had no effect on weight, and yet they have improvements on glucose tolerance as well. And then in DBA mice, there is no improvement in either sex, even though we had seen some effect on female weight. And then here in the HET3 mice, we see a really robust effect on males. Um, even on the medium protein diet, there's improvements and then no effects in females whatsoever. So why are we looking at all these sexes and strains? One of course, is that we wanna know how these might apply to humans overall. Humans are a very heterogeneous population. Um, but the other is that we can gain some new insights into mechanisms uh, through analysis, analyzing this. So here we're doing a correlation um, of about 30 different uh, traits that we measured in these animals, looking at what happens, uh, the correlation between response to these in these various parameters and a dietary protein. And so here we're looking at C57s, DBAs, and HET3s of both sexes. So what does this tell us? So the first thing that this tells us is a lot of things correlate very well with dietary protein across sexes and strains. And a lot of uh, things correlate, anti-correlate very well with sexes and strains. And so there's a lot of a response to dietary protein that be, is conserved regardless of your genus type or your sex if you are a mouse. But then here in the middle, there's a lot of heterogeneity. And so these are parameters that seem to vary by sex and strain. And some of these are a lot of interest potentially um, if we think about metabolic disease. So changes in adiposity, changes in insulin sensitivity, and so on. If we do some principal component analysis, you could, this is another way of sort of analyzing this data. You could see that we have overlapping responses, but distinct responses between the different strains and the different sexes. Okay, so now we have this data and we have a lot of physiological data and we wanna gain some more molecular insights into what's happening. And so what we did next was to look at the livers of these animals and to look not just at their transcriptome as we did in our calorie restriction study, but also at the metabolites and the lipid species that are changing. And we then did a correlation analysis. And so here we have about 800 uh, things that are changing uh, differently in uh, D DBA mice to C57 black six mice, including both sexes. And so this includes all the differentially expressed genes, metabolites, lipids, as well as all of the phenotypes. And so what does this tell us? So when we look at this, um, we find that if we do unbiased clustering, we get about six different clusters. And each of these clusters contain some phenotype data, some transcriptomes, data, so genes are changing, some metabolites are changing, and some lipids are changing. Now, this gives us a couple of different thing, ways to go. So one thing is that the phenotypes in each module are probably associated with the genes, metabolites, and lipids that are changing. And so this gives us some information about causation, potentially, um, that we're continuing to explore. But it also lets us look for things that may or may not make a lot of sense. And so one of these relates to a hormone called FGF21. And interestingly, we saw that there's a very small cluster of FGF21 that relates to insulin resistance and thermogenesis. And that kind of makes sense as I'll explain. 
But interestingly, FDR21 does not correlate with all the other phenotypes that we see. So why does this matter? So FGF21 is essentially an energy balance hormone um, that's produced in response to fasting. Um, and it's also produced by a lot of other um, stresses, including calorie restriction potentially, um, depending on exactly what strain and sex you're looking at, um, restriction of specific amino acids. It's re in response to cold. So people have been exploring this as potentially a way to um, increase energy expenditure in people and people have made drugs. Um, that are FGF21 agonists and tested them in humans. But the other thing that's really interesting is that FGF21 is produced in response to protein restriction. And so a number of papers have come out over the last uh, eight years saying that protein restriction is really mediated by FGF21. And so these studies showed that FGF21 is induced in mice when you um, put them on protein restricted diets and we've seen uh, the same things and that this leads to signaling into the brain. The brain turns on thermogenic genes and adipose tissue in the response. Um, and the FDA 20 also regulates food intake as well during these responses. So why did we not see FGF21 clustering with everything? Well, when we looked at FGF21 levels in the blood of our mice, we found something that was quite odd. So you could see that there's a very strong induction of FGF21 in C57 black six male mice sort of a non-significant induction in C57 females, um, but almost no change whatsoever in DBA or HET3 mice, even though some of these strains have metabolic responses um, to protein restriction. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out, if you look back in the literature, basically every experiment that's been done on FGF21s has been done in C57 black six males. And so maybe this doesn't relate across sexes and strains. So we're still trying to move our FDF21 allele into other genetic backgrounds. And so we'll have more on that later. But um, what we were able to do right away is look at what happens when we delete FDF21 from a mouse. And we look not just at males, but also in females. And so when we do this, um, what we see is that um, in male mice, mice on a low protein diet gain less weight if they're wild type. That's the gray line here. Um, but if we knock out FDF21, they gain weight on a low protein diet. But females, it's totally different. So in females, um, the wild type mice and the knockout mice respond very similarly to dietary protein, um, gaining weight in both cases. Something that's a little bit easier to see is food consumption. So in a wild type male uh, black six mouse, when we put mice on a low protein diet, we get a major reduction of food intake. And that's basically because they are eating a lot more to fuel their thermogenesis. But, and in knockout mice, we block that completely. Energy expenditure similarly goes up when we uh, put mice on a low protein diet and in the knockout mice blocks that completely. So this is all well and established with the literature. But in females, it's totally different. So in females, there is an increase in food consumption on a low protein diet, but in FGF21 knockout mice, when you put the mice on a low protein diet, it actually goes down. So it's actually the reverse. And there's no effect of FGF21 status um, on the response to dietary protein um, in terms of energy expenditure. But knockouts tend to have a little bit less energy expenditure overall. So here we've used this correlation analysis and looking at different sexes and strains to gain some new insight um, into the molecular mechanisms that mediate the response to dietary protein um, and to sort of disprove this sort of longstanding hypothesis about how dietary protein um, really controls things. So what is it about a low protein diet that really regulates metabolic health? So taking a step way back, right? Dietary protein is made up of amino acids, um, which are the building blocks of protein. They're assembled together by ribosomes in your cells. Um, and there's a lot of different amino acids. Typically though, we focus on the 20 common amino acids and of those nine are essential. So, um, and that's true for both mice and humans and they have the same list that's essential for them. If you have deficiencies in those amino acids, really bad things happen to you. Um, but overall, there's um, most people in the United States and most people around the world don't really have um, amino acid deficiencies anymore. So of those nine amino acids, some of the most interesting um, metabolically are the branch chain amino acids. And these are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. You probably heard about branched chain amino acids because they're very popular health supplements. 
So people who are into bodybuilding and weightlifting tend to take a lot of branched chain amino acids um, or lots of protein supplements or potentially both. Um, so definitely a lot of people have heard about these. Um, from a metabolic perspective though, they've been known to be interesting for a long time. So it's shown in 1969 that these amino acids are elevated in the blood of people who are insulin resistant. And since that time, it's been shown by many different studies that they're elevated in the bloods of humans who are insulin resistant or have diabetes, that the same is true in rat and mouse models of obesity and diabetes. And they actually correlate very well with glycated hemoglobin. So um, if you have more glycated hemoglobin in your blood, um, and your blood glucose control is worse, you're very likely to have increased levels of branched chain amino acids as well. It's been proposed that these could actually be a molecular marker predicting whether or not you're going to develop type two diabetes because people who have higher levels of branched chain amino acids in their blood are more likely to go on uh, to develop diabetes overall. Interestingly, these amino acids also change in humans when we do protein restriction. So in our protein-restricted human study that we did with Luigi Fontana's laboratory at Washington University of St. Louis, people who are on a protein-restricted diet for six weeks, they had less of fat mass, they had lower fatty blood glucose. And when we looked in their blood, we also saw that they had lower levels of branched amino acids. Now you might think, and certainly we thought at first too, but if you're restricting dietary protein, all of the amino acids in the blood will change, but that's not true. In fact, uh, methionine, which is a very famous uh, amino acid, lower in a vegan diet. Dr. Krines, of course, is an expert in uh, methionine restriction. It doesn't change on a low protein diet, but the branched chain amino acids do by about 10%. So we wanted to know what happens when you consume less branched chain amino acids. And we've tested this a variety of different ways. Um, the first study I'm going to show you is a lifespan study. Um, here we put mice on either a control diet or a low branch chain amino acid diet starting at a relatively young age. Now, what's a low branch chain amino acid diet? So a low branch chain amino acid diet um, for the rest of this talk or low overall, is gonna mean a 67% restriction. So it's the same level of branch chain amino acids that's found in a 7% protein diet. Whereas our control diet is about 21% of uh, the calories coming from amino acids. Okay, so we follow these over their life. Mice, first they grow, then midlife they tend to get fat, and then later as they start to get older and frailer, their weight tends to decline. The same thing happens in humans, or at least used to happen in humans before the obesity epidemic. Um, weight tended to peak around 55. So what we could see is that um, our controlled diet fed mice throughout their lifespan tend to weigh more um, than our low branch amino acid diet fed animals. So low BCA diet fed animals are leaner and they also have improved glucose tolerance. And this is true again, across a variety of ages. Um, at different points during the study, we looked at both male and female black six mice and we found that there was improved glucose tolerance at all of these time points. We also tracked frailty. So we started looking at frailty here about 16 months of age, which is pretty close um, to the youngest that you get frailty in a mouse. And we tracked what happens to their frailty over time. And you can see that in both male and female mice, frailty increases with age, but males had a very interesting response. So here we see that the control diet fed animals um, are continuing to have increases in frailty, whereas the low branch amino acid fed animals are not. And so frailty is diverging over the, the course of these experiments and our controlled diet fed animals are becoming frail more quickly. And this correlates very well with what we see in terms of lifespan as well. So here we're looking at lifespan in either low BCAA fed animals or um, a low amino acid diet, essentially a protein restricted diet with 7% of calories coming from amino acids. And what we see is that in male mice, there's a quite a, a profound increase in lifespan. So median lifespan in these animals increases over 30%. Um, and we saw an increase in maximum lifespan here as well. Interestingly, this is male specific, and we'll sort of uh, see a little bit more about the sex specificity as we go on. In females, a low BCA diet had no effect um, on lifespan. And in possibly a low protein diet was actually slightly de deleterious, um, but uh, we didn't have enough animals to make a clear conclusion about that. And the reverse is true as well. So Steve Simpson and Samantha Stolen-Bignier's laboratories in uh, the University of Sydney 
have shown that if you take mice that are a bit older and start feeding them a high branched chain amino acid diet, their lifespan decreases. And so overall, the more branched amino acids uh, you eat, if you're a male mouse, the worse your lifespan is gonna be. Now, what's changing here? So in these mice, we really were interested in this frailty phenotype. So we decided to focus on skeletal muscle. And we took the skeletal muscle of the animals and looked what happened to gene expression, both males and females, on a low branch amino acid diet. What we saw was about thousand genes or so changed in male mice. Well, about half that number changed in females on a low branch amino acid diet. Um, looking at this in a principal component analysis, you can see that the genes are also different as well. So for control diet groups here, more or less overlap, and they're pulled apart in different directions um, when we put either males or females on a low branch amino acid diet. Look at pathway analysis, we see something uh, that's pretty remarkable. So both male and female mice on a low branch amino acid diet have tons of pathways um, that are being uh, regulated by a low BCA diet, but they're entirely distinct. Um, so there's actually zero overlap. Now, one of the things my lab works on that I haven't talked about today is the mTOR signaling pathway. mTOR is a protein kinase. And basically, if you genetically or pharmacologically inhibit mTOR, you get longer lifespan in mice, um, as well as in lower organisms. And we saw that there was changes in the mTOR signaling pathway. And when we looked in the tissues of the mice, doing Western blotting to look at the phosphorylation of specific proteins, we found that phosphorylation of mTOR substrates was decreased in the male mice. Here, you can see that fairly clearly in the case of S6, there's a lower M a phosphorylation of S6 as well as S6K in mice eating a low branch amino acid diet. But interestingly, this is only true in the males. So just like in our pathway analysis, when we look at females, we actually see no changes in mTOR signaling. So overall, what do we see? We see that males and females have different responses to a low branch amino acid diet. Um, they both have metabolic improvements but we see improvements in frailty in males, as well as decreased mTOR signaling and increased longevity. And so overall, these may be due to changes in mTOR complex one, or they may not be. Uh, we don't know about causation, but definitely there's a correlation here. So the thing that we've been working on for the last few years is trying to understand which of the branched amino acids might regulate these effects. So almost everyone has been analyzing the branched amino acids as a group, and people take supplements of branched amino acids primarily in a group. Um, but really, uh, something uh, that has been emerging is this idea that individual BCAAs might have distinct effects. And so to test this, we placed mice on diets that were either our control diet or a low BCAA diet, or which we reduced the levels of each individual BCAA by 67%. And what we found is that they really do have distinct differences. Here's a glucose tolerance test. And you can see pretty quickly that the red line here is the lowest overall, as well as the lowest area, having the lowest area under the curve. And that's our low isoleucine diet. So just reducing isoleucine alone by 67% has major improvements on glucose tolerance, whereas leucine has no effect on glucose tolerance, no matter how much you bring it down. In subsequent experiments, we brought it down to about 85% restriction. If you bring it down all the way to zero, which of course is not sustainable because it's an essential amino acid, you get very small effects. So isoleucine in particular is very potent. Um, why does it improve glucose tolerance? So we were able to do clamp experiments to look at um, quantitatively assess glucose output and glucose uptake into various tissues. And we see that under normal conditions where the animal is just fasted, there's no difference between the control fed animals and animals eating a low isoleucine diet. But when you give insulin to these animals, um, you shut down almost all the glucose production at a relatively low dose of insulin in the low isoleucine fed animals, but not in the control animals. And so dietary isoleucine restriction improves hepatic insulin sensitivity as part of its mechanism of action. We see very similar effects when we look at other metabolic phenotypes as well. So our effect on adiposity and dietary fat is very strong when we look at branched amino acid restriction or restricting protein. And restricting isoleucine alone is sufficient to completely block fat mass accretion in young growing black six male mice. Sort of taking a different look across multiple diets and multiple different outcomes, um, what I wanna stress here is our control diet is very different 
um, from our low isoleucine diet and our low branched amino acid diet. Low valine tends to have trends in the same direction. So there definitely um, seem to be some benefits to restricting uh, valine, particularly in diet-induced obese mice. But leucine is quite different. And so restricting leucine actually seems to lead to worse metabolic outcomes. Um, particularly, they seem to be a little bit fatter and they actually have quite a bit of subcutaneous um, adipose fat that you can actually feel the difference in the mouse. So I spent some time telling you that dietary protein has different responses across sexes and strains. This is true for isoleucine restriction as well. Um, but actually isoleucine restriction seems to be more potent and more universal. So here's just a look at glucose tolerance. And you could see that in Western diet fed mice, so these mice are being challenged from a young age by eating a high fat, high sucrose diet that's supposed to be more American, um, that we, when we restrict isoleucine, in all cases, we have um, reduction in the area under the curve during a glucose tolerance test. And the amount of that restriction varies but the direction never does. Um, so even in these blacks, in the DBA female mice, um, there's still a, a very clear trend towards a reduction in the area under the curve. So of course, we're still investigating what the mechanisms are here. We're doing a variety of different types of experiments to do so. One thing I can tell you is a low isoleucine diet promotes the beijing of inguinal white adipose tissue. So this is a process whereby the fat literally becomes browner because it has more mitochondria um, and uh, its histology changes and they express different genes. Um, and we see increased expression of thermogenic genes in this adipose tissue um, across the board when we look at isoleucine restricted mice. When we place mice in metabolic chambers um, that we have in our animal facility, we see that isoleucine restriction alone is capable of increasing energy expenditure we see similar effects when we restrict valine. Um, and in fact, valine tends to, restriction also promotes brownie and beijing of white adipose tissue. So low isoleucine or low valine diet seems to be beneficial in those regards. And we also looked at FDF21. Now to remind you, you know, what I said earlier, we have, the effects of FDF21 seem to be very specific for black six males. Here we're looking at black six male mice. So the strain in which FDF21 does, definitely does seem to play a role. And we see that in the case of isoleucine restriction, um, it seems to be essential for the effects of a low isoleucine diet. Here, um, we see that isoleucine restriction increases food consumption in wild type mice. That's blocked completely in our FDF21 knockout animals. When we look at energy expenditure, we see about half of the effect of energy expenditure is blocked in FDF21 knockout mouse um, and is more profound in, in wild type mouse. Um, but there are other effects that FGF21 is not required for um, in a low isoleucine diet, including glucose tolerance. So we've also been doing lifespan studies on these mice. And what we see is that just as in our black six mice were restricted uh, branched amino acids, isoleucine restriction alone seems to be beneficial for frailty. Um, and so what you can see is particularly in the males here, um, there is increased frailty at all time points in the control diet animals um, versus the low isoleucine fed animals, particularly as they get older. Um, and there's less of a difference in the females. And this correlates with what we see in terms of lifespan as well. So in our lifespan study, we see that there's about 30% extension in male lifespan. And you can see that that is incredibly robust in both in terms of median lifespan, as well as a huge increase in maximum lifespan. And we see an effect in females as well. Um, so, but it's much smaller, it's about 7% in females. So everyone wants to know whether um, this relates to humans as well. And so we worked with Kristen Malecki at a Survey of Health of Wisconsin to try and analyze some of this data. And what we found is that dietary isoleucine levels are correlated with higher BMI in people who live in Wisconsin. Um, so this is data from about 788 people who completed nutritional surveys um, and for which we also have a variety of data like uh, height and weight. And what you can see is that um, for the non-epidemiologists in the or audience, the beta here is important. So if we were to go from 4% of our diet to 5% of our diet being made up of isoleucine, which you could sort of see is within the human range, you predict that your BMI would increase by about 2.5 based on this. Of course, you know, a healthy BMI is on the order of 25 or a bit higher. And so you can imagine that potentially as much as 5 to 10% of BMI might be um, changeable by changing dietary isoleucine. 
Now, what's low in isoleucine? Lots of things are, are low in isoleucine. The thing that's sort of clearest and easiest to say is that bird meat has less, less isoleucine and less branched amino acids um, compared to most other forms of meat. And probably emu uh, is the best, but turkey uh, would also be a good choice. So um, you can, uh, this Thanksgiving, think about the fact that you'll be consuming a low isoleucine diet as long as you don't load it up with too many other isoleucine containing foods. And there seems to be human data as well suggesting that isoleucine is important for aging. So uh, this is an unbiased machine learning study that was done by a group in Germany. And they found that isoleucine levels in the blood were predictive of increased mortality. And importantly, this was specific for isoleucine um, as opposed to uh, leucine and valine, um, which actually have a counter correlation. Um, and so it definitely seems like dietary isoleucine and isoleucine in the blood um, are bad things in general. So in conclusion, what I've shown you today is that decreasing protein or branched amino acids or isoleucine improves metabolic health. The effects vary with sex and strain, particularly in effect size, but across the board, there are uh, general uh, beneficial trends. A low branched amino acid diet reduces uh, activity of this kinase mTOR complex one um, and extends lifespan in male, but not female mice. When we restrict isoleucine, we get very profound metabolic benefits, and we extend the lifespan of genetically heterogeneous HET3 mice, so those were more representative of the human population overall. Um, and finally, um, at least in preliminary data, we see that isoleucine is associated with increased BMI and mortality in people. Of course, it remains to be determined you know, in a randomized clinical study if we were able to uh, reproduce those findings. And overall, um, I'd just like to say that this is sort of a generally evolving idea that dietary composition and particular amino acid composition um, really has profound effects on both lifespan and health span. So methionine restriction has been known for a number of years since I believe the early 1990s to extend the lifespan of rats and later more recently shown in mice. And here I've shown you today that isoleucine restriction really has this effect as well. And both of these interventions improve metabolic health. Um, there's some data on suggesting that leucine and tryptophan restriction might have potential effects on lifespan. Um, it remains to be seen whether those really hold up. Um, but neither of those really have metabolic benefits in the same way uh, that we've seen today, at least in our hands. We also see that lysine restriction um, tends to not have any particular effects on metabolic health uh, in our experiments. And then a number of other uh, amino acids we and other labs have shown have improvements in metabolic health when we restrict. And some of the more recent work from our lab has focused on histidine restriction, where we show that histidine restriction does not regulate lifespan, um, but particularly in males, it causes a dramatic decrease in adiposity. Um, and interestingly, um, histidine also correlates with uh, BMI in people who live in Wisconsin. So I'd like to thank um, everyone in the lab, and in particular, the people who have done the work that I've talked about today. Um, Heidi Pack uh, did the most of the calorie restriction work. Um, Charles Yu and Nicole Richardson have done the isoleucine study, uh, or sorry, the um, isoleucine branch amino acid lifespan studies. Um, Mikhail Murphy did some of the sexes and strain work, and Carrie Green did isoleucine restriction in the HET3 mice. And of course, thank you all. Thanks to all our funders and collaborators at UWL elsewhere um, and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dudley, for that amazing talk. Let's open it up to questions. Let's start with Lynn. Um, will you just repeat the, the question? So sure. Um, so let's all understand, still trying to figure out what's the best way for me to lose weight and live longer and enjoy. Um, <laughs> that being said, uh, in any of the studies that are really intriguing, have you looked at the intersection of exercise and calorie restriction or fasting and um, what the impact of that would be? So we just started looking at the interaction of exercise. Um, so the question was, have we looked at the interaction of exercise and diet um, and calories? And so we just started looking at um, the interaction with exercise with Troy Hornberger and Adam Kanopka. And the problem was that for, you know, if you take a mouse and you make it do aerobic exercise, it loses weight. And so that's not very interesting to us because it, it puts in a confounder uh, in our experiments. And so what we recently did, um, and we have a preprint up now, 
is uh, we trained mice to do resistance exercise by cart pulling. Um, and so this is a form of exercise that causes muscle hypertrophy and strength gains, um, but not weight loss per se. And so we put these mice that were either uh, exercise trained, resistance exercise trained through cart pulling um, or sham control that pulled an empty unloaded cart. Um, and we put them on either a low protein diet or a high protein diet. And what we found um, was really uh, quite in agreement with our ideas. So low protein diet mice stay lean and they stay lean regardless of exercise. High protein diet fed animals become fat unless they exercise, in which case they're lean. And so if you eat a high protein diet in our mice model and you don't exercise, you become fat, but exercise is completely protective against the effects of protein on adiposity. And one thing that's interesting and um, remains to sort of be seen, you would predict based on the human experience and what people you know, advise that you're gonna gain strength faster on a high protein diet with exercise. And we see that in our mice as well. But interestingly, by the end of the exercise period, which is about 12 weeks, the low protein diet fed mice and the high protein diet fed mice are equally strong. They can pull an enormous amount of weight and it's the same. Um, and so even though they gain that muscle mass faster, eventually the low protein diet fed mice catch up. Um, so it remains to be seen you know, how that applies to humans. Two sort of related questions. So when you when you measure glucose tolerance, typically through an IQ glucose tolerance test, and there are clear effects on metabolic health by different dietary restrictions. So that's very different though than when the mice are eating, it's not measuring when the mice are eating and the postprandial effects of what the mouse itself eats. It's measuring you're measuring the postprandial effects of that, that glucose bolus, right? So I guess what I'm asking, and my first question is, do you, is it possible that any of these effects come out of the postprandial uh, effects of the dietary restriction based on what the mouse is eating? And have you, is there, do you have a way of sort of looking at that time period? I mean, we, we uh, do we have a way of looking at um, the sort of postprandial effects of eating per se, rather than um, this somewhat artificial uh, environment of a glucose tolerance test. Um, any answer is yes, we've done that in our calorie restriction studies. And so we're still working on um, writing that up. But um, overall, there does seem to be effects on, uh, you know, post meal prandial glucose tolerance. Um, if you want to want to call it glucose tolerance, I guess it's meal tolerance. Um, it remains to be seen uh, whether that's true for um, uh, isoleucine restriction or other effects as well. But um, I think, yes, you could definitely do some interesting experiments there. And then I guess one, one follow-up question quick is, you know, if you, so one, one assay that can be done is a meal tolerance test, right? H has anyone uh, looked at, at dropouts of specific amino acids um, within the context of just that meal tolerance test to try and address the question of, I mean, are there differences in, for example, the Ig ratio or something like that postprandially um, in, in that context? Um, so you know, have people looked at um, you know, the effects of dropping out individual amino acids during a meal tolerance test? Um, yes, people have looked at, drop at that. Um, there definitely are some effects and people have also done experiments you know, looking at um, the uptake of individual amino acids versus following refeeding into the portal vein versus circulating levels, right? And so the liver is exposed sort of directly to the um, amino acids that are coming in in the meal, whereas the rest of the body seems not to be for the most part. Um, so there are some really interesting things to think about there. Um, def definitely, you know, that could be some more experiments that we do. Dudley, uh Great work, uh, always exciting to understand what we should try to be eating. Um, and uh, what I'm wondering about is specifically uh, the circadian uh, patterns and how circadian patterns influence the data you're collecting. Undoubtedly, you know, these are nocturnal kind of animals too. So, so I'm just kind of curious to what extent there is an impact of the circadian cycles of these animals and some of the, uh, the findings that you're identifying. Um, that's a really interesting question. So um, we have done some of those studies and as soon as we get the last Western blocks, uh, we will be uh, sub submitting those. But um, to answer your question, there are pretty profound effects of calories on circadian uh, cycles. Um, and so 
there have been reported at least um, different answers. Overall, calorie restriction extends lifespan regardless of whether you do it sort of at the beginning or end of the um, night cycle in terms of when you feed. Um, but we see um, you know, time of feeding effects um, are really uh, the strongest. So it doesn't matter whether you feed during the day or at the night, but depending on when you look after they consume their last meal, uh, that actually has a really profound effect on things like insulin sensitivity and what you observe. Um, and calorie restricted mice actually have kind of a, a quite paradoxical um, postprandial increase in insulin resistance that um, then becomes more insulin sensitivity after about 16 to 20 hours. So there's some really interesting uh, potentials there. And we actually see circadian um, pathways being predicted as one of the things that change by fasting as well. It's nice talk uh, with a general interest. So my question is personal. So uh, my triglyceride is high and I try to reduce that and uh, do several different things. Uh, I'm not eating the dinner, uh, walk uh, three miles all day and uh, uh, try to reduce uh, uh, carbohydrates and uh, with a uh, high rich uh, food. So I would like to see you first part. Fasting is good, so that is good part. I worry about the second part, you know, uh, high protein, maybe it's not good as a lower protein diet. My question is uh, whether if we have the high protein diet with a high rich, the fibers and uh, vitamins that counteract downside of the high protein uh, levels. So my, mice are not human. So, you know, everything there is, is taken with a grain of salt. Um, but overall, high protein diets and low protein diets actually seem to have effects on hepatic steatosis in mice. And they actually tend to be both beneficial. And so that for, as it relates to hepatic steatosis, there might actually be a U-shaped response curve. Um, and that might correlate with the human um, study in that there have been a number of clinical trials of high protein diet for NASH in humans. Um, but as to anything uh, in terms of anyone's specific events, I defer to all of my medical colleagues here um, for their specific advice. Should I turn it on? Is it on? Uh, thanks, Dudley. Um, is anyone looking at hormonal differences between men and women? I imagine there are some women who respond more and some, uh, sorry, not women, female mice and male mice who respond more and less. And so is anybody trying to look at what those factors might be? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So that's actually something that we're planning to do uh, in terms of looking at the correlation of hormones and dietary protein intake and how those relate um, to the phenotypes we see. Um, we sort of ruled out doing the sort of um, more straightforward goadectomy experiments just because the effects are so gigantic. Um, you know, when we overectomize mice, they become very fat very quickly. And when we castrate mice, they become, you know, they don't gain lean mass very quickly. Um, so those effects are sort of, sort of predominating. That's why we didn't take that approach. Um, but we're going to try and do some correlations with hormone levels and see uh, what comes out there. Dudley, lots of questions remotely. We can't get to all of them, but uh, let's, let's, let's try a couple in the last two minutes. Uh, one is links between your work and dementia. Uh, well, Reggie in my lab thing over there is uh, leading our work into Alzheimer's disease and dietary protein restriction. And definitely seems to be some uh, benefits to both calorie and protein restriction as they relate um, to Alzheimer's disease and mouse models. Another question, uh, I think it was from uh, Miriam Shalef. What are the links between your work and the microbiome? Oh, that's a really fascinating one. So um, dietary protein restriction or restriction of individual amino acids has massive effects on the microbiome. Um, but our lab and uh, Jay Mitchell's lab um, both have shown that that appears to have no relation to the metabolic effects that we see whatsoever. Um, and so there must be a role in microbiome since there are such dramatic changes uh, but what those are actually doing remains somewhat of a mystery. All right. I think we need to be respectful. Unfortunately, we can't get to all the questions. Uh, remember, there's still donuts in the back, and there's two hours that you can consume ad lib before you have to start fasting. Thank you. Oh, wow. Really good talk. Thank you. Lots of questions.